So thank you for having me here. Um, I have a tendency to speak very quickly, and everyone has spoken English so perfectly that I, I forget myself. So I would try and stay nice and slow. But if there's questions or anything, feel free to interrupt, or we can talk about it later. Um, so we have a mixed audience here. So I've been watching all these amazing crowdfunding presentations all day long. And as I did that, I was updating the slides to not be embarrassed in front of all of you uh, and to incorporate some of those elements. So I'll try to talk both to sort of the popular audience and uh, to the academic audience here. So I want to try and cover why I think crowdfunding is still worth studying, uh, even though I encourage us all to keep doing this, provide some evidence about why I think it's important uh, and what we can learn from it. And I want to do that by asking four linked questions. And some of this has research that some of you have seen already, um, some might be new research for you. But I want to talk about first why studying crowdfunding is a good idea and why those of us in the room should care about this and feel good that we do care about this, otherwise we wouldn't be here. Uh, and then I'm going to ask about a question that's really been bothering me, which is uh, whether or not we can democratize access, increase access to entrepreneurial opportunities, and whether crowdfunding and crowd investing can help us do that. Uh, and the related question is how smart the crowd is, and should we trust the crowd to be doing these things? And then I'm going to end up with, I hope, kicking off some discussion that will fill up with a panel and also in our later dinner and everything else academically about where to go from now, from here so that we have a thriving field that supports each other in these kind of research efforts. So, uh, and I'm going to use a lot of my papers. I'll, those are not the only papers on the subject. Many of you have written better papers on some of these topics, so I just feel bad I haven't been able to swap everything in, but I'll be talking mostly about my research. Uh, but that doesn't mean that there's not a lot of other important work being done. Okay, so first, why study crowdfunding? Um, so there are four kinds of crowdfunding, and I wrote in the halfway through today, but you know this, because I think everybody in the room knows crowdfunding well enough to have a sense that there's multiple flavors. Uh, for the few uh, newcomers here, um, the, we academics, because we're academics, will argue over which of these is crowdfunding or crowd investing and which ones aren't. Uh, it's not a very interesting fight. Um, so I'll just say for my purposes that there is equity crowdfunding, Peer-to-peer -peer lending, which is the more dubious of the set, uh, reward-based crowdfunding, and sort of charity-based crowdfunding. And those are the main examples, of which um, most of the attention has gone to equity and reward-based crowdfunding. Uh, so equity crowdfunding, as you heard today, legal in many parts of Europe. Uh, it was legal as of May 2016 in the US. It's off to a slow start in the United States for reasons that we can discuss. Um, but a lot of that has to do with the, some of the regulatory issues but also the fact that um, in the U.S. at least there's many sources of early seed funding and crowdfunding is not yet legitimated as a major way of raising money uh, in, this, in this sort of field. So uh, they're off to a slow start and we'll kind of come back to that issue. Uh, I have done a little bit of research with, uh, with some of my partners on this, uh, like Alicia Robb uh, at Berkeley and others, and the early results we have, at least in the U.S., equity crowdfunding dynamics look very similar to reward crowdfunding dynamics. So there's a lot of important caveats that you've introduced in the European context that we don't have access to the same data in the US yet. So I'm not considering it to be universal, but it's just in terms of what gets people to invest, we're seeing fairly similar types of patterns, but our data is still much cruder than the kind of data that you guys are collecting here. So I'm hoping to learn more about the European context, and I've learned a lot today uh, that, that helps inform that further. Um, so I mostly study reward-based crowdfunding, and especially on Kickstarter. Um, so Kickstarter's raised over $2 billion, um, and uh, that's where most of the research has been. So what I'm going to try and talk about most of the time today is sort of universal principles we can pull out of crowdfunding. But I wanted to justify, for everyone who studies Kickstarter and Indiegogo, the value of using those as proxies for studying things like innovation and entrepreneurship. So um, crowdfunding is a pretty substantial source of innovation. Um, and so there's a lot of canonical examples that those of us in the room have discussed already, like the Pebble Watch, Oculus Rift, um, and uh, 3D printing. But um, just to give you a sense of this, I've done, conducted a survey recently of, um, of over 60,000 successful Kickstarter projects and 200,000 people who backed them with the help of Kickstarter. Um, and what I want to show you just to justify that there is real innovation happening. So when you study crowdfunding, you're studying something of real economic and innovative value. Uh, the chart at the bottom is the percentage of projects in each category that either self-reported that they won major awards, that's red, or that they uh, filed for a patent, which is orange. 
So the patent rate in, in the product technology space is over 25%, right? Which suggests that people not only think there's real innovation, but are willing to engage in standard IP practices in order to protect those as well, right? So there is real innovative activity, and we don't have to just say it anecdotally. We can actually point to the evidence and say these are categories um, that, that really interesting things are happening. And I want to talk about why they're innovative in just a second, uh, and where the sources of innovation and crowdfunding are. But I think it's worth kind of noting that. A second reason to note the importance of, uh, again, this is US Kickstarter data, or rather international Kickstarter data, most of which is in the US. Um, but crowdfunding actually leads to startup activity. So this is, again, reward-based crowdfunding. Uh, I found that in, uh, that in the sample of the 60,000 project that raised money, raised money on Kickstarter, resulted in 5,000 new ongoing companies and 11,000 companies that continued to get, um, got additional funding but were pre-existing, right? So that's a fairly large source of economic activity and new venture activity. Uh, this shows you in this chart the number of, or whether people set up organizations or products by product category. And the line divides product-oriented categories, things like technology, food, product design, video games, from more art-oriented categories like publishing and theater. And what you can see is the gray line shows you that there's no formal project in the art-based, uh, no formal company. So in the art-based categories, you didn't see a lot of companies. It was mostly individuals doing things in formal groups. But when you look at the company, uh, the activity in the product-oriented categories, you'll see that there is a large number of new organizations, the darker blue color being formed. Right? So there is really good reason for those of us who are interested in economic activity and innovation to study this field. We don't need to justify it as crowdfunding as an analogy for something else. On its face, crowdfunding seems to reward crowdfunding seems to lead to valuable economic activity. In fact, for every dollar that goes into a crowdfunding campaign in the US, um, you get a, a fairly large multiple. So in the survey, I asked people about the revenues they made over the last couple of years outside of crowdfunding. So for every dollar they raised the crowdfunding, how much money did they make outside? So I, I did the math there. And on average, it's about $2.60 in revenue generated for every dollar raised in crowdfunding. And you can see by category, food actually is the product category that has the highest activity. Um, and you can see also technology uh, and does quite well for itself. The only category that goes into the negative is film. Um, so I, I continue to see don't try and go to film, I guess is the lesson. Um, but the point here is that there is real, genuine outcomes from this, that the dollars that go into crowdfunding act as a multiplier in the wider economy. Right? And we're talking a lot about money, but it should be clear that money is just a piece of why crowdfunding is valuable. In a separate survey, I asked uh, uh, people who received crowdfunding uh, what, what the value of their results were, uh, of the crowdfunding campaign was. And what I found was that it turned out that uh, I need the money for the larger campaigns was actually ranked as the third or fourth biggest reason why people were bothering to go crowdfunding. Instead, they were doing it to learn about customers, to build communities out of customers, and to, uh, and to get press and outside attention. Right? So crowdfunding is part of a strategy and not the only reason why people are going through these efforts to raise this money. Okay, so. That, that's, that's my justification for why crowdfunding is valuable on its face, right? But it also gives us insight into a lot of really interesting areas that we otherwise um, don't have as much of a chance to discover. So, um, I, what, what I think is most important about crowdfunding is what it does that's sort of different in the world. So you can imagine that we've had a situation for a long time where we've known that we have communities that are innovative and doing interesting, innovative work and discussing things online. You can think about Twitter, your Facebook community, your online forums that you're on. But for a long time, those communities might have been innovative, you know, hobbyist forums, but they had trouble making change happen in the world. So crowdfunding is a way that online communities can actually affect change in the world. So I'm going to give you a little quiz here, okay, to, along these lines. Um, and I'm going to describe four films that were all on Kickstarter before 2013. And I want you to tell me which, based on this community principle, which of these do you think got the most funding, okay? So we're gonna start in the upper left. This is BronyCon, all right? So this is a, uh, a phenomenon. There is a children's television program in the United States called My Little Pony. It's aimed at small girls. Um, it has magical ponies that have powers. Uh, and it has been adopted widely uh, by, by older adults, especially men, who like the message of magic and empowerment. They dress up as ponies and go to conferences. They call themselves bronies. 
So this is a documentary about them. Okay. <laughs> Upper right corner is a, 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 a sort of beautifully illustrated film about, or it's a fantasy about uh, a, a, a girl who suffers from spontaneous combustion who bursts into flames. So sort of a, a, a existentialist kind of drama. This is a movie about um, the, uh, somebody who's really obsessed with the comedian Adam Sandler and makes a documentary about it. And the bottom right is a movie about a, a uh, pot-smoking computer hacker who frees information for the world. Which of these do you think raised the most money? The first one. The first one. So the first, so the first one, right? So why, why do you, why, what, what would we need to know about it to know if the first one raised the money? What kind of treatment would we, who would be the one creating the project? In order for it to raise the most money, what do you think? Insider or outsider? Insider. Yeah. So this, if this was created by somebody who who was actually sympathetic to the bronies, this is a group that's widely mocked, right? And here, there, somebody was willing to tell their story in a in a in a nice way, and indeed, it raised over three hundred thousand dollars. It was the most funded Kickstarter project in movies until 2013, when films started to go on Kickstarter in a very large way, right? And this only makes sense if you understand that this is not just about a product being placed out there. This is about communities organizing themselves, right? So if you think about the Oculus Rift, the virtual reality home that was bought by two billion dollars by Facebook for two billion dollars, and Palmer Lucky who created this. Um, it, what happened was Oculus uh, virtual reality was very popular in the late 1990s. A lot of money went into it, and it turned out it didn't work very well. I don't know if any of you had a chance to play any of the virtual reality games back then, but there were these large, heavy headsets that cost tens of thousands of dollars and very crude graphics. You'd fight a pterodactyl or whatever it was. It was a very crude game, and it never lived up to its promise, so venture capitalists moved away from it, and no one would touch this space. So what happened was there was always an enthusiast group. Palmer was one of these enthusiasts. And when he was ready to run his Kickstarter campaign, he posted to his community forum saying, hey, I'm going to launch this thing. Uh, can anyone help me with a logo? Can anyone help me with interesting design? And that was the original community that started funding the project. Right? So this is not just about sort of outside hits. This is about internal communities and people with reputation who are able to raise from them. So, and that could be anything from sort of these, this My Little Pony, Brony thing, which turned, you can watch the movie now, apparently, um, to 3D printing, which is another area where there's a lot of enthusiasts producing material, and if you had to go and get that to a conventional manufacturer, it would be a very expensive and difficult process. So, um, given that communities are important, it raises the question of, does crowdfunding democratize the way we innovate and develop entrepreneurship? So, you, don't worry, you can't read this very clearly, you don't have to, but traditionally when you were trying to get investment for a, a venture idea of some sort, there were intermediaries who would stand in the way. They were venture capitalists, private equity firms, investment banks, angel networks, and those were the people who were making decisions about who got what. Crowdfunding, you can go directly from the crowd to the people who might be potential investors. And that's important because, at least in the U.S., this is the guy who gets all the money. Uh, not directly, but per, pretty, he looks like this, the person who gets all the money. This is a white male Stanford grad, so from a good school, right? And if you're a white male Stanford grad uh, at, uh, in, in the U.S., you get a disproportionate share of venture capital, right? And there's a lot of reasons why you get a disproportionate share of share the venture capital. There's geographic issues. There are it's easier for VC to be connected to these people. But the problem with existing intermediaries is they have all of these sets of biases. Just to give you an example, uh, so, so what's interesting is how does crowdfunding work to democratize who gets access to these sorts of resources? And there's a number of forces of democracy that are already in play that crowdfunding uh, take, helps out with. So one of those is the fact that, um, so many of you also know the user innovation space. So I think there's sort of a connection here, which is we know that innovation is already fairly democratized. Right? It's not happening mostly in research labs. It's happening everywhere from everybody. So in some of Eric von Hippel's work, he shows that 22% of surgeons in, in Germany have modified or developed their own surgical equipment. 36% of plumbers have developed their own hardware for hanging pipes. 26% of librarians have developed their own software for managing libraries. People are innovating any time they have a problem. Right? They're just obviously innovating in large companies. So there was a nice study by Von Hippel and Flowers and Company looking at a representative survey of the UK and finding out that 6.1% of all UK consumers, that's almost 3 million people, had developed an innovation 
that had been uh, adopted by at least one other person outside their family and friend network. Right? So if you total the amount, not even the amount of material, not even the amount of time, but the amount of materials costs going into this, that meant there was 1.4 times more expenditures going into R&D for consumer products from consumers than for all UK consumer R&D combined. Right? So there is a huge amount of innovation that's already happening. The problem is always with getting to market and connecting to people. So uh, just to give you a sense of how much this, the process of launching products then have dropped, uh, and I realize that this is very disturbing to see feet so large in a video, and I apologize uh, on this big screen. Um, but um, the cost of launching a web-based startup has dropped by three orders of magnitude since the late 1990s. So you used to need $2 billion to launch a company, and now you can do it at $200 in a couple hours. right? So it's not just the innovations everywhere. The cost of launching innovations has been dropping at the same time. And it's not just software. Uh, sort of recent analysis of startups in the hardware space have found that you can go launch a hardware product project complete end-to-end -end manufacturing and get this product shipped to you from China for less than $50,000 of overhead. I mean, this is, these are really dramatic changes. So everyone was already innovating. Now they have the tools and the ability to be able to reproduce those innovations at a much lower cost uh, than before. So the amount of capital you need to launch something has dropped dramatically. So what's happened as a result has been radical changes in the way innovation and entrepreneurial innovation is funded. Uh, and I think it's happened in the U.S. and it's been happening at a lag rate elsewhere. So it used to be venture capitalists and angel investors were the only people who would give you money because you needed $3 billion to launch a website. No, none of your friends have $3 billion. You'd have to go to a venture capitalist firm and hope that they would give you that money. Right? So very few people, most of those Stanford grants, were the ones who were receiving that kind of cash. Then as the cost of startups started to drop, you had the rise of angel investors who were very influential and could give money and had enough money in the pocket to make that happen. Around 2005, the, uh, because it became so cheap to fund startups, the next major innovation happened with incubators. So incubators like Y Combinator, Techstars, were able to launch projects <coughs> that gave people $20,000, $30,000 in funds and some mentoring and generate entirely new startups as a result. And as the cost has dropped even further, we're seeing even, for, even more uh, the crowdfunding can now fill that gap. So I no longer need official investors because I don't need a million dollars. I don't need even $100,000 to launch a project. I can do it for $70,000, $50,000. I can do it with the amount of money I can raise online. So this is a really fundamental shift, and I don't see any of this going away. Right? Even if crowdfunding evolves, even if we change to some other method, the low, increasing, decreasing cost of innovation is, is going to be critical uh, in entrepreneurship. So unfortunately, not everything is good. right? So there's some barriers to democratization. Costs might be dropping, everyone might be innovating, but there's still some things standing in our way. Um, so um, this is a US map, but money and networks are not democratized. So the mean distance between a venture capitalist and a firm they invest in is 80 miles in the US. 80 miles, right? So this shows you the concentration of deal, of seed deal investments uh, through 2014 in the US. And you can see, if, you, if, if you're further back, everything's washed out, but maybe one to two splotches, right? And you know what those, those colors are, right? It's going to be Silicon Valley, maybe New York, maybe Boston. But if you're in vast amounts of the United States, and I can draw a similar map for Europe, there is no access to venture capital. You're not part of the network. You're not part of the connection. Right? Another problem is, uh, is uh, a scriptive uh, 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 discrimination. So in the US, 40% of business owners are women. Right? So 40% of all US businesses are owned by women. So can you guess, based on what, how much how many of the, what percentage of VC-backed companies have a female co-founder in the U.S.? Give me a number. So 40% of all businesses. Five. Five is optimistic, right? So it's, it's, somewhere around, it's somewhere around three to six percent. Just one co-founder is more, right? So there's clearly something very wrong there, right? Because it's not, all of our studies on uh, female entrepreneurship and bias suggest that women generally perform as well as men and under some conditions perform better. And under discriminating conditions perform a little bit worse, but not that much worse. So there's something going on here that's creating these sets of barriers, right? So we have, so the, this is where kind of crowdfunding becomes interesting because we can ask, what, does crowdfunding eliminate some of these geographic concerns and some of these discriminatory concerns? Because everyone's innovating, it's cheap, 
We should be making sure that it's not just, in the U.S., the 10,000 well-connected people who are getting money, because ideas should be everywhere. So um, on the geographic side, uh, there's some evidence of geographic uh, democratization. So there's been a lot more careful papers than the ones that I'm putting together here. So this is some basic evidence uh, that shows you that, uh, that the number of investments are scattered everywhere, but there's been a lot of further studies that show. So I looked at geographic Gini coefficients, but there are other measures. And by almost every measure, crowdfunding is better spread out than we see. This, by the way, shows you backers in the United States, which are sort of everywhere. Right? So there are local effects still, but you get huge geographic uh, democratization. Uh, but you also uh, you know, might get gender democratization. So I want to talk about a, uh, a research paper I had looking at this subject uh, that's coming out in ASQ. Um, trying to figure out when and if uh, gender, gender, the gender discrimination issue starts to go away. So it's based on uh, the oldest social theory I think we have, which is homophily. So Aristotle wrote about homophily that like attracts like. So birds of a feather flock together. You like people who resemble yourself, right? And so this could be actually kind of pernicious policy uh, for people to have. Because what happens is you have uh, networks of people, right? And I tend to associate with people who look like me. So if, if you have a venture capital network and it's mostly white men, they will tend to associate with other white men, right? And we see the same thing with ethnic groups of national origin, and you like those people better. And therefore, those people have exclusive privilege to your network. But let's say that you're an enlightened individual, and you realize that you're being discriminatory in this way. So you're not going to be obviously discriminatory. You're going to try to figure out a way to let anyone into your, into your project. The problem is uh, something called induced homophily. So even though I may want to see female entrepreneurs as a white male venture capitalist, as my network starts to include more men, white men, and they include other white men from Stanford and so on, it, it creates a situation where the network locks out people who are different, even if individuals want to act differently, because my network, which is where I get my information about how to make investments and who to invest in, becomes exclusively white male or predominantly white male, it becomes very difficult for other individuals to enter this network. So we call this induced homophily. The individual legging is choice homophily. It's that I choose to uh, uh, associate with someone like that. Induced homophily is the overall network effect. So the traditional solution to this has been let's promote more women as venture capitalists, and then they'll create their own exclusive induced network with women. Right? And we can even things out by basically solving the problem. So we wanted to look at whether or not this was solving the issue. So we turned our Kickstarter data. This is work with Jason Greenberg at NYU. And um, we found something interesting. So we looked at the, this, this is the success rate of founders in different industry areas. So fashion, children's book publishing, film, technology, and video games. We picked these because they have different amounts of women backing projects, right? So uh, fashion has a majority women as those children's book publishing as backers, as investors. Uh, and then film, technology, and games have a, minor, have a more, film is even, basically, and the others are minorities. So we expected that if this argument about homophily was true, that basically what crowdfunding would do would be letting more women be able to participate, you'd expect that women would be outperforming men at a high rate in these categories, in fashion and publishing, because that's where women were predominant as factors, right? Uh, and, and by the way, there's a huge effect. So women are, are about 60% more likely to succeed than men in crowdfunding all other things being equal. And that's the only area of investment that women outperform men that we found. So VC, there's a known bias. Bank loans, there's known bias. Angel investment, there's no bi there's bias. But the bias is pro-women in crowdfunding. So we're trying to figure out why. We thought, OK, if the reason is because women can support each other, mm -hmm. we would find all of the support happening here. But statistically, almost all the impact is at this end. Women outperform men by a huge amount in areas where they are least represented not most represented, right? So the bias actually is, is not where we were expecting it to be, statistically. I know you can see some effect here, right? But it actually washes out. So women are outperforming when there are almost no women as backers. So we were trying to figure out why this was the case. So we actually conducted an experiment uh, after doing some theorizing. So what was the theorizing? Our theorizing was that homophily is not just a dyadic thing, right? So with the dyadic traditional view of homophily is that, you know, Lars and I look alike, so we, we, we're more likely to associate with each other, right, uh, than somebody who is different and has a different kind of background, 
right? We theorized instead there might be something called activist choice monopoly, where I wasn't just considering my dyadic relationship, but I was also thinking about the group that we share as a dyad, right? So if, uh, if uh, dashing business school professors are being discriminated against, the fact that that's happening, you and I would recognize that as fellow group members, and that would influence my desire to help you out, right? So I'm helping people to help overcome a perceived shared disadvantage in that. So for a minority group, the fact that you felt that you were a member of a minority that, uh, that was being discriminated against would it make you more inclined to help other people from the minority group in situations where they were being discriminated against. So we actually measured this and we conducted a lab experiment. What we did was take this project here, which was Makey Makey. It makes anything into an electronic keyboard. It was, uh, for a while, the most funded project in terms of number of investors in the technology space on Kickstarter. And we showed this project in a lab experiment with one change. So we took out the real inventor and we included either Jessica Smith or Michael Smith here, right? Most common name for millennials. These are both picture people from a, a Dutch project that took representative photos of individuals dressed the same way, same basic haircut, same basic smile. And they are judged by a, a project at Princeton that these people are equally attractive. Okay, so if you could calibrate your own sense of who you find hot by looking at these pictures <laughs> and deciding which way you go. Because statistically, these are exactly attractive, like the really same attractiveness, right? So we didn't change anything else about these projects that people were viewing except that some of them saw this as created by a woman, and some of them saw this as created by a man. And then we also measured homophily, right? So we measured, we measured whether, so we, uh, what we actually did was gave people bonus money and asked if they wanted to invest some of that money in a project. We asked them quality of the project, whether they were looking at it. And we also measured whether or not they felt a connection to the creator, whether it was, and whether that connection was individual or an activist choice. What we found was kind of interesting. We found that for men, there was no bias one way or another. They didn't seem to be more inclined to support men. There was no homophily, uh, activist homophily. There was some individual homophily towards men, obviously. But none of that had an effect on willingness to, uh, to, to back projects. The difference was for women. So, and this was kind of interesting. So the women who, uh, who responded to activist choice things, who felt that women rep were, that, that it was important to help other women, who were, in, uh, who were being discriminated against, who felt that technology was a place where women were discriminated against, and who saw a connection to the woman being funded, were more likely to both give funds and to think that the quality of the project was higher when they saw a project created by a woman. That was about a third of all women. The other two thirds of women, when they saw the project created by the man, they thought that was a higher quality, right? So completely felt the opposite. There was nothing changed about the project. Everyone saw one project, right? So this is a large, larger sample study. But it meant that the women, the activist women thought the project created by the women were better and were willing to give money to support them. If they saw the project created by the men and were not activists, they liked the project better, but they were less, they didn't have any inclination to give money. And this effect the, actually totally mediated all of the effects that we were seeing. Right? If you look at the paper, we've got all our diagrams and Sobel Goodman stuff and all that thing. But basically, the, um, the, uh, almost all of the direct effect, 83% of the effect plus, was moderated by this activist choice monopoly. So what does this mean? This means that groups that were previously disadvantaged against in crowdfunding not just get, don't just get an advantage by getting access to other people, but they also get tap into this activist space of people who want to support each other. So it's not just a pure investment decision people are making in crowdfunding. There is a strong emotional component based on a set of shared characteristics with the founder which is something I think we need to keep in mind when we do our research, that it's not purely sort of a rational and back this project, but you're doing evaluations based on descriptive characteristics, some of which may operate in sort of interesting ways. So that's, that's one set of findings. So what does this mean? I think that overall, to answer our first question, crowdfunding can lead to democratization, because it increases the number of people who participate, and it seems to allow you to overcome historical disadvantage by activism. Okay. So what's the second question? How smart is the crowd? Um, and so um, this is a big issue because there's two sort of famous books written about 100 years apart. One of them is called The Wisdom of Crowds by James Terwicki, which kicked off a whole interest in crowd decision making and prediction markets. But if you go back 100 years before that, there was a famous book called The Madness of Crowds that explained that when you get crowds together, they set fire to witches and buy tulips and do all sorts of crazy things. So the question is, when we have giant crowds making decisions instead of experts, what happens? And we actually watched a really interesting paper on exactly this topic 
earlier today that, that showed uh, some factors in this, and I'll try to bring that up as we go. Uh, but uh, So I decided to do a study with Robert Langanda of HBS, and this published in Management Science, where we looked at the most objective category we could think of at crowdfunding, which was theater. Right? So here's a case where you expect it to be a very large high culture, low culture divide. And this is a big deal because as of 2012, in the United States, more money goes to the arts through Kickstarter than the National Endowment of the Arts, which is the official government agency that sponsors arts in the United States. Right? So the crowd is now a bigger source of arts funding for new projects than, than the government is in terms of support culture. And if you talk to theater people about this, they get very worried right? because they think, uh, this is just going to be many more musicals about talking cats, right? And many less high concept theater projects. So we brought in uh, experts who judge these sorts of theater grants in to evaluate projects that have been supported on Kickstarter before. And we use the NEA official criteria about what makes a project good, about artistic merit and feasibility and response to an audience. Uh, and we and we also looked at so we, and we looked at Kickstarter projects. So we knew what happened to the project, they didn't. And we got to see sort of the outcomes. The first study was that crowd experts surprisingly agreed, even in this very subjective non-investment field. So 60% of the time, the crowd and uh, experts agreed with each other. And more successful projects that the crowd liked tended to be ones the experts liked also. When there was a disagreement between the crowd and the experts, it was almost always because the crowd was willing to fund something that the experts were not. So, the, so it actually lowered the bar while having the same quality direction, lower the bar for projects, more projects will get funded under this regime than otherwise. So we actually just, uh, we had this nice thing because we were able to look at older projects, at older theater projects, we were able to see what happened to these things after they finally appeared in the theater. And what turned out to be interesting was um, how this ended up working. So we were able to look at the projects that both expert and crowd funded and follow them forward. And I judged the project as success if the project was staged and ran for its allotted period, right? It was considered a failure if it closed before uh, before it was supposed to. It was considered a, a commercial hit if it had a long-term extended run, and an artistic hit if it won a major theater award. So the things the experts of Crad both liked, almost all ended up being fine. There was one big commercial hit out of it, but almost all of them were staged, ran their piece, and left. When you look at the project the experts did like, but the crowd was willing to fund, the picture is different. We have our first failure, which was a great review in the New York Times uh, of this project, which said, uh, when I came to the theater and started watching the play, I tried to think of anything good I could say about it, and the font on the programs was pretty nice. <laughs> right? So it closed after one, after one or two performances. That was it. So that was the failure. Uh, but they also had two artistic hits that won major theater awards, and two commercial hits that ended up having extended off Broadway runs. Right? And everything else was a success. Which suggests, right, this is not firm data, but it's bulk data, but suggests that what the, what the crowd selects for is sort of increased variance. That they're willing to let more things get a try, more innovative things happen, increase the chance of failure, also increase the chance of success. For those of you who got to see the paper today about uh, the crowd opinion versus expert opinion on loans, I think you see some of the same thing. There's increasing evidence that experts are more conservative and more likely to avoid failure but are less likely to embrace it, potentially breakthrough projects. So I think this is good news in terms of the evaluation of crowd and experts. Um, I've done a little bit of work in looking at other signals of quality and comparing the signals of quality that investors look for with the kinds of signals of quality the crowd look for. And statistically, I found that things like having endorsements, right, having uh, a newspaper article on a crowdfunding site saying this is a great project, that increased your chance of success. In the same way, professional investors look for endorsements. Having a team with experience, which professional investors look for, will also increase your chance of success in crowdfunding. Showing prototypes or detailed plans helps. Uh, so a single spelling error in your description of your project in Kickstarter decreases your chance of success by 13%. Right? So there are crowds looking for real detailed kind of information. On uh, the other hand, I look at things the internet might like that real humans don't care about. So, um, do you have a cat video? Um, do you talk about Star Wars? Right? Do you mention that you're a nerd? Something like that. None of that really predicted success in any serious way. So the crowd seemed to be pretty rational in picking the kinds of projects that investors would have also picked. And I think it's more evidence for this in some of the failure research on Kickstarter. So the failure rate on Kickstarter is surprisingly low. I have a study that shows about 9%. 
right? So it's hard to compare that to raw startup data because of the way people are doing things, but about 9% of projects don't deliver. Uh, and what I think is really heartening about this, and I know uh, a lot of you are involved in projects looking into this stuff in more detail, but as far as I can tell from my data, I can't find a significant predictor based on easily available data on what the outcomes, uh, what, what causes failure of crowdfunding once you've been funded. Right? So I have access to data that investors would have, and I'm still kind of going through that. But if you look at just the kind of information that's provided on a crowdfunding website about who the inventor is, their background, none of that predicts failure. So once failure ha once you have been raised funding, it is not immediately obvious which projects are going to fail. Right? So gender doesn't work, education doesn't work, team or individuals doesn't seem to work, whether you have children doesn't seem to work, marital status doesn't seem to work. Right? Which, I, again, is, I think heartening news from a democratization standpoint. It means that you should feel free to invest in you know, uh, a married woman with children or, you know, or somebody with a high school education or whatever it is, and the chance of success given funding doesn't seem to be very. Um, so I've seen this picture several times uh, also. So the other issue is fraud, right? So failure is one thing, right? Which means honest attempts to make something happen. As far as I can tell, the fraud rate is very low. So it looks like, in my sort of study, that less than, uh, the, less than about 1% of projects, or 2.5% of projects, may I count it, are actually fraudulent. So there's a few big examples. A lot of those turn, but a lot of them turn bad later on. But in terms of raising money initially, most are not fraudulent. So, uh, and the reason for this, I think, is interesting because it's rooted, rooted I think, uh, in the community piece. I know a lot of you are investigating this further, so I'd love to have a conversation about it. Uh, but here is one of the famous examples of a, a very sophisticated attempted fraud on Kickstarter. Um, and it was Kobe beef jerky. So beef jerky made of the finest meat. Uh, and it was a brilliant idea to raise money uh, as a fraud because not only do, does everyone like high-end meat and beef jerky, but um, which are on trend at the moment, but also uh, the, it was a great fraud because you couldn't tell. They could actually go through the, whole, through the whole project, raise money, and then actually send you beef jerky at the end and say it's totally beef jerky. And there's no way you would know that it wasn't, unless you had a very discerning palate. So it was a brilliant fraud, and they put a lot of effort into this fraud. So this, this group actually ended up hiring a bunch of people, uh, or faking a bunch of people, and creating accounts on Kickstarter of all these fake individuals who then chimed in once they launched their account saying they had tasted this beef jerky and it was amazing. Right, so a very sophisticated fraud. They had somebody who pretended to be a military veteran who would yell at people who, who didn't want to buy the project uh, product, that they were being unpatriotic. Uh, There's a whole very elaborate ruse. Um, and what stopped it is something called Linus's Law. So Linus's Law is, uh, is from Linus Torvald, the inventor of Linux. And Linus's Law in the programming world states that with enough eyes, all bugs are shallow. What that means is if enough people look at a problem, to someone that problem is going to be trivial. It's why these conferences are so great, right? Is that I stand up in front of a bunch of people, if I made an error, one of you will note it and tell me later and I'll feel bad, right? But the same sort of thing happens here, which is that as, because remember the community aspect, as a project starts to be successful, more and more people are drawn to look at that project from different communities. So you wouldn't know it, but there is an online community of Kobe beef fanatics, and there's an online community of, of uh, beef jerky. Fanatics. And as this project started to be successful, both those groups started to look at this project and started to ask questions that were difficult to answer. Things about that there are only 2,000 pounds of Kobe beef imported into the United States every year. How are you going to get enough to do this kind of project? What tag numbers are your beef? Because all the beef have particular numbers, serial numbers in Japan that are associated with them. The jerky people started saying, well, actually, fatty meat makes very bad jerky. And you can only use these very specific cuts because Kobe beef is very fatty. How are you going to get around this problem? And under the weight of this sort of evidence, errors started piling up. And it was eventually flagged as a fraudulent project and Kickstarter shut down after raising $100,000. Right? So this was not stopped by the fraud team. This was stopped by a group of people who were spotting this kind of error. And you'll notice that in certain areas where the, the platform never steps in when fraud is indicated, which Indiegogo has frequently happened in the past, Right, fraud is much more likely than a scenario where the individual user can spot a fraud and, and flag it and shut down a project. So fraud on Kickstarter, this is very low for this set of reasons. It doesn't mean it doesn't happen. And there's a lot of fraud that, you know, a lot of fraud might happen after the fact, right? The person who buys a house with the money they've raised um, because they're being foolish. But in terms of intentional fraud, very low. Lower than you'd expect given this entirely unregulated market that you think would be built for this kind of fraudulent stuff. 
So my answer here is that the crowd is surprisingly wise. It seems to use rational criteria to decide when to back projects. It allows higher variance projects to succeed, so it gives more people opportunities. Uh, and fraud is low, but it has to be said that this is conditional on um, projects having enough eyeballs, right? enough people looking at them, projects having enough diversity of people looking at them, and platforms needing to be willing to work on signals. So if you have a small equity platform that doesn't act on signals of fraud, and doesn't have a lot of people on the platform, and that's a very non-diverse group of people, you're going to have a much higher fraud problem than you would on Kickstarter. So platform size is a strong indicator of fraud, of the potential for fraud. OK, so um, a few minutes left. So I want to talk about the last question, which is what I think we should be looking at next. And so first, I want to speak to the academics in the room, because I think this is an important question, right? Which is what we want our research to be, or a community here. Um, and this is great. I mean, it's been amazing to, to have all these people see all these talks on simpler issues. Thank you guys for citing me, by the way. That helps my tenure decision is, is being made, so I appreciate it. Um, but I think that there's, there's a question that was first asked at sort of the Berkeley Conference in 2011, and I think it's important now. So the, 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 the worst case scenario for us in some way is that crowdfunding is, that we only study crowdfunding as a phenomenon itself. So we do papers about crowdfunding that are only about things that are interesting if you care about crowdfunding. And I care about crowdfunding. I think it's important. But it, I think we have to be careful that it's not the only thing we do. Uh, when Toby Stewart was talking about this as a new field, he was pointing us to the danger of the entrepreneurship literature, which, although it was broken out recently for many years, was really a specialized set of literature and specialized journals. Because entrepreneurs insisted, entrepreneurship scholars insisted that entrepreneurship was a very different thing than other kinds of organizational research or strategy research or finance research. And so it became a very isolated group. So I think we need to be, we can talk about crowdfunding, and all my papers, I think, say something useful about crowdfunding itself. But I think just being a community that talks about crowdfunding to each other, I think is a dangerous kind of outcome that puts us out of the A journals that we all want to publish in, right? Or the B journals we want to publish in. So I want to give a couple other options, right? Another option is that you can use crowdfunding as a non-left-centered view of entrepreneurship and innovation. And I think this has been very productive for some people, right? So if crowdfunding is essentially innovative and entrepreneurial activity, and I hope the evidence I've provided will help you guys make that argument when you want to do that. Um, but that what's always tough about measuring innovation and entrepreneurship is we end up only seeing successful cases, so we end up with a left-centered problem and we lose a lot of data that we need to do to understand success factors. So crowdfunding, whether you do it internally, or we saw a great paper earlier about crowdfunding in a company uh, context, gives you a chance to observe failed attempts as well as successful attempts. So if we, as a group, continue to insist that, uh, that this is something, crowdfunding is a way of measuring entrepreneurial and innovative activity, then papers with that as the analogy, right, uh, we can write papers that are talk about these fundamental issues that matter to a lot of people at top journals, right? So that's one option is we can, we can talk about crowdfunding as a study of innovation entrepreneurship. Another way is similarly, maybe one step up in the advancement level, is talking about crowdfunding as a new way to organize, right? So um, crowdfunding has interesting elements of user communities, of online community discussion, of self-organizing systems, of markets as, as opposed to hierarchies. And I think we can use this as an example. Again, the main focus of the paper would not be discussing crowdfunding. It would be talking about these issues from a data set that we all have information about and we have a lot of data in. So I think there's a real possibility there for the future of our research. And then I guess the, the, the in some ways, the least interesting but most popular outcome would be if crowdfunding just becomes a general proxy for finance innovation. So it becomes the next path database. So basically, Anytime I mean, it becomes a generally accepted way of measuring entrepreneurship or innovation is, is measured crowdfunding. And that's, that's great if, you know, for a citation count perspective, but in some ways it loses a little bit of the magic of crowdfunding by, by doing that proxy. So I'd like to suggest at least that we should see more and more papers that meet those middle two categories, that either use crowdfunding as a way of looking at entrepreneurship and innovation and activities, or use crowdfunding to try and push our view of organizations and finance and strategy into the 21st century when traditional large organizations are not the only form of company and increasingly we see new forms of organizing that are more social, non-hierarchical. And I think there's a lot of exciting research to be done, but I think it's important that we don't put ourselves into a narrow box 
where we're crowdfunding people talking to other crowdfunded people, right, about crowdfunding. So I think it's so important we need to have these discussions. So I want to sort of ask the general question that we keep talking about over drinks and dinner, which is how do we avoid, you know, how do we work together as a community, right? How do we, what do we do to keep this conference that you've organized that's amazing alive and keep these discussions alive? Because I didn't even know about many of these papers, and they've completely informed a lot of views of things I'm working on, and I know it's probably happened vice versa. So I want to think about how to do that. Um, and, I, I, and also, there's a final drawer problem. So I've seen a lot of papers that I know people have already done work on and shelved because they either did find interesting results or um, they had paper problems getting the paper published. And that's, that, that's a problem in all of social science, all of science, but especially a problem with crowdfunding because I think a lot of us are keep going for the same low-hanging fruit, not realizing that it's low-hanging, that it's been tried to be picked before and it's not low-hanging fruit anymore. So I'd like to encourage more ways of us thinking about how do we share sort of the partial papers or tables of abandoned projects so that we can learn from stuff that isn't working. Um, and you know, I, I spent a year, and I, I think people figured out a better way of solving it, working on a paper that transformed into something else utterly, where we were trying to show learning effects in crowdfunding by looking at serial founding events. Um, and we were just weren't able to find anything interesting. Now, it doesn't mean there isn't something interesting there, but it would be helpful if I could share with you why we failed with this, so that you don't have to spend the same months doing the same regressions that we did with Kickstarter data. Right? And in the end, we found a very interesting gender issue, and that's what we're working on for our paper. But I, I want to think about these issues. So one thing I was thinking about suggest, suggesting is, when I was at MIT, we were doing, and there was a big push for research on user innovation and open source. And Prudy Lakani and Irfan Hippel set up an open directory that anyone could register for, be approved if you're an academic, where you could upload a paper and an abstract. And it could be on any kind of, even pre-SSRN style working papers, or just ideas for papers, so that you at least have directory people working on similar things to find people and papers that you might be interested in working in or calls for effort. Is that something that would be interesting to you guys if I went for the effort to do that? Would you, if I sent an email to this list, would it would just as a question I have to be interested in doing that on the academic side? Okay, so I'm gonna put some effort in trying to do that and get some funding to do it. I'm happy to coordinate with you guys as well. But I think having some sort of crowdfunding.research.something would be a really useful tool so we can start throwing up that set of stuff and find collaborative opportunities. Because I don't, I think we, we don't move forward if we just keep picking over the same bones over and over again uh, and don't kind of move forward that way. So that's my academic message. Um, the other thing I would say is what's missing from a lot of crowdfunding work and from a lot of policy discussions with crowdfunding is the value of community. So crowdfunding isn't just about funding, it's also about the crowd. So thinking about why community matters is important. When I surveyed failures, the, the, the issue about community came up first and second in, in failures, and why people attribute failure to crowdfunding. So an average project in the film category, if you have 10 Facebook friends, you have 9% chance of succeeding. If you have 1,000 friends, you have 40% chance of succeeding. Now, I'm not saying that's causal, but I, I think we need to keep in mind that this crowd stuff matters also in crowdfunding. Okay, and so what does it all mean? I think we're in a space that continues to, I think I'm out of time, right? Uh, a space that continues to evolve, um, but it really is interesting to think about crowdfunding as a way that communities make things happen. Most of the news about crowdfunding is good. It gives people more opportunities, it'll lead to more businesses, more small companies, and more innovation. Uh, but the flip side is that government and policymakers are now in the room, need to figure out their role. There's not a lot of systematic problems yet. But we're also not seeing equity quite take off in the way that you expect it to, given how our word is going. So it's worth thinking about. Um, so that's it for me. Thank you. Uh, feel free to contact me. I put up all my papers on Startup Innovation.org. I will figure out a new site, and we'll communicate through you. We'll email everybody out and try and build a community around this that I think will keep lasting. But I, I, I want to encourage, if I can help in any way, please let me do it. I mean, still junior faculty, I'm not that useful, but I'll be as useful as I can be. Um, and I'm sure other people feel the same way. So we'll hopefully bond together over sausages later uh, and talk more about this. Thank you guys very much. I appreciate it.